so excited to be talking on this episode with comics reader, author. I, I don't know the exact <clears throat> uh, Jaren that you want to use there to describe yourself, but delighted to be talking with Trung Lei Win. Trung. Yeah, thanks so much Welcome. for having me. Yeah. Uh, do, would you say comics creator? Would you say author? Would you say author artist? Auteur? You know, it really depends on who I'm talking to. Um, if I'm talking to colleagues, I'll be like, I'm a comics creator, just like you. But if I'm talking to most anybody else, I, I'll tell them I'm a cartoonist. It feels it feels the least pretentious to be like, I draw funny pictures. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no. Well, and graphic novelist, of course. There, mm -hmm. There's always that title as well. Um, I tend to use the word comics just to sort of level the term a little bit yeah, so, yeah they're, comics. they're comics. long comics <laughs> yeah exactly exactly um so folks out there probably know you best for the magic fish i was just at the ncte conference uh actually and presenting in the morning and someone mentioned we were going around and talking about books that had kept our attention and someone mentioned the magic fish and we were talking about just some of the interesting work the comics grammar all of the the details that you bring into that book so it continues to resonate and continues to be uh, among the first that people mention in a room full of people that talk about comics oh that's uh, great <laughs> i'm yeah. always delighted to hear that yeah absolutely absolutely uh, curious about what drew you to the medium what was it about comics that sparked your attention and creative interest Sure. Um, well, in kind of more recent presentations that I've been doing, um, whenever I'm talking to, you know, educators or librarians or even parents who are a little bit hesitant to include comics within their, you know, their children on their children's bookshelves, um, I talk about hybrid languages a lot because yeah. that's kind of the environment that my my family grew up in. My parents and I learned English at the same time, so I got to help them through that process. And I didn't read a lot of comics growing up, um, but I did get a lot of, you know, books from the library, a lot of illustrated books of fairy tales, and my parents and I would read them together. And growing up, I also would always note that we don't, we didn't speak two languages kind of discreetly. We spoke them both at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that most multilingual households do that. When, mm -hmm. you know, someone forgets a word in one language, they can reach into a different vernacular and pick up that same word or something, you know, along the same line so that the conversation can continue to roll along smoothly. And so it sounds like a broken language to an onlooker, but it's something that is unique in every household that speaks multiple languages because you just want to make sure that everyone kind of can follow along and you don't leave anybody behind in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think as an adult, I gain an appreciation for comics because comics are like that. Um, now, if I'm talking to, you know, if I'm talking to an academic kind of environment, I can be like, oh, well, comics employ a visual lexicon and it has an evolving orthography that's dynamically negotiated between the reader and the author and the text. And it's, you know, but it, it, it basically just means that, you know, everybody can read a comic because we all read symbols all the time. Mm -hmm. And every comic has a sort of slightly different grammar. And the fact that people can glean meaning from it means that everyone is able to dynamically in real time pick up on the meaning in a comic book. And that's incredibly exciting that everyone can can kind of do this to a certain extent. And it is something that people kind of need to be taught how to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's still it's still something that I'm really passionate about making sure that people understand is that, you know, comics might be regarded as something for easy readers or for reluctant readers. And I don't take any umbrage with that at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful that there are a lot of books that get people back into the habit of cracking open a book and feeling good about finishing it. Like it's it's just the comics are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. But I love what you said there, too, about translanguaging and drawing on language. Uh, I don't know if I want to use the word tools, uh, but drawing on multiple languages, because it, it just speaks to the complex work that people do and the complexity of language and how beautiful comics are in terms of bringing together multiple different ways of communicating all at the same time mm -hmm. um, so so very well said very well said and you mentioned fairy tales there as being one of yeah. the uh, source materials the roots and the influences so i'm guessing that some of that love of fairy tales 
made its way into the magic fish that that, that explains <laughs> some of the storytelling there yes. oh my gosh absolutely as a matter of fact the magic fish's framing device the story within a story structure of it was kind of uh was almost a little bit of an afterthought because i've mostly was trying to find a way to you know do the comic book version of those like color fairy books you know like I really just wanted to draw all my favorite fairy tales and my agent and editor were like well you know you need to sell it to a particular age group so that means that there needs to be a protagonist with like an arc and like you gotta you gotta make it you gotta bring all those things home and tie those stories together somehow and so that's kind of how that happened yeah and without spoiling anything the um the way that you go from story to story within a story in that book is just a it's a really brilliant creative move as far as drawing on what comics can do as well thank you yeah yeah it's uh i i love that that comics can be that flexible it's um it's something that I um, that surprised me when I was actually working on the book because a lot of the like a lot of the storytelling formal innovations were kind of by accident. I think really the only thing that I remember thinking of doing kind of formally within the the comics medium while making the Magic Fish that I did on purpose was that I don't tend to use action lines very much. I wanted the Magic Fish to kind of be um, accessible to people who don't read a lot of comics because I knew it was probably going to be a book that you know, would be shared in a library or a classroom. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, the teacher didn't get confused. And I right. find that a lot of the comic book language that uh, puts a lot of newer readers off can be found. Like, you know, your superhero books are, are kind of for your advanced comic readers. They're very mm -hmm. busy. And so you have to know how to read a comic already. And so all of the the formality of a superhero page is a little bit too complex. And so I don't use things like action lines. I don't use a lot of onomatopoeias for, um, you know, sound effects in, in, the, in the Magic Fish. Uh, I tend to use, I convey movement with fabric and with hair so that people can kind of get a sense that there's gravity and that mm -hmm. there's, you know, a space that characters are moving through. But for the most part, everything is very pared down so the comic book language is is very beginner friendly yeah uh, and with superhero books there tends to be this like whole narrative structure that's been going on for for decades mm -hmm. that can also be kind of a barrier for the entry point if you oh, don't know the the characters and relationships yeah yeah no it certainly was for me as as a fledgling comics reader <laughs> Uh, going back to those early days of comics reading, were you one of those readers that would check out something on a page and then keep notebooks and sort of experiment in that way? Just just curious about some of your creative process and how that's evolved. Not really. I picked my books based on what kind of drawings I wanted to emulate, right? Nice, <laughs> nice, yeah. And so I think the only comics when I was little that I read simply to read because I enjoyed the comics were uh, Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> and, nice, yeah. and, you know, those Calvin and Hobbes volumes that you could find at the library. Um, I also read, you know, some Archie comics here and there because our local library stocked the, uh, the, the digests that you used to be able to buy on the spinner racks in grocery stores. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I actually wound up reading uh, a lot more, uh, you know, illustrated books and fairy tales because I loved turn of the century kind of children's book illustrations, um, it turns out. And so I wound up studying that sort of thing in college. But I most of the, the visual references that I pick up and that I lean on are from, you know, children's books, illustrated books, um, which are kind of distinct from comics. They have a relationship to comics that I tend to like to talk about, but they're 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 I, I consider them to be distinct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'm so curious about now sort of where you're heading and what you're thinking about creatively and um, some of those some of those steps that you're taking. Well, I mean, I'm still very much learning how to do things. Um, and I figured out pretty early on in the process in The Magic Fish that no two creators works the same way. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because it's my first narrative project. I'd never written a work of fiction before, really. I think the last creative writing thing I did was a high school class <laughs> before I, I wrote The Magic Fish. And so I, I leaned on all the things that I knew how to do already. Um, and one of the things, and this doesn't spoil the book at all, but it has a pretty non-traditional story structure in that mm -hmm. it's actually structured like the only thing I knew how to write, which was an essay. So the magic fish, you know, it starts with a thesis and it has three supporting arguments and then it reiterates the thesis at the end with I a twist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I always like to tell students that if you're embarking on a creative writing journey, oftentimes 
the tools that you learn in middle school writing a book report is all, all that you really need. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Love it. Love it. Yeah, as, as somebody that's taught that form a lot, I greatly appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, it can you, if, you, if you stretch it, it can become really beautiful. Yeah, but and I love it. I love to think about writing as this template that then can be changed, explored, expanded, applied across media. So uh, a very cool note there as well. Yeah. So yeah. you mentioned, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that um, there were some folks that had been on the podcast curious about people that have been sort of supporters, connectors, folks in the the industry that have been especially kind voices along the way. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. So, so many people. Um, I love my editor, um, at, uh, Penguin Random House, um, Random House Graphic. Um, Whitney Leopard is someone that I had worked with before in a very small capacity. Um, when she worked over at Boom Studios, um, Gina Gagliano is, uh, incredible. She was the person who, who picked up my book. And I think she's working, uh, kind of more directly with readers in, on a book festival circuit now, which, which is fantastic. Um, Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And I think one of the things that ends up being really valuable to me is that I didn't plan to be a professional comics person for a long time. I was just kind of making little cartoons and little drawings and posting them on the internet and kind of, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was networking laterally. I found people who were also doing, you know, that sort of work and had different aspirations. And we all, you know, wound up in different places, but, you know, connecting with other artists who were kind of on a similar journey or trajectory uh, was really fantastic. Um, I think by the time I became a professional, I, you know, had the good sense to realize in hindsight that a lot of people are kind of trying to network upwards and, you know, trying Mm -hmm. to meet you know, editors and people who've been in the industry for a long time and their their advice can be really valuable, but I think it's really wonderful to be able to to find people who are kind of where you are as well. So you can all be on this little caravan together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and Whitney's name, I think this is the second time that Whitney has come up in a talk. So definitely someone who is uh, promoting the work of comics and supporting creators. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, no, Whitney's fantastic. She's a she's a person who's both uh, just a very insightful editor, and she's someone that I, I I trust creatively very much. So it's it's fun to work with Whitney. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have one more official question that was mm-hmm. on the list, and we can of course touch on anything that we might have missed that you want to make sure to share. Uh, and that is places that you go for creative inspiration as you continue to create and explore. And the sub part, there's a part B to the question, which okay. is uh, where can listeners go to sort of follow along, learn more about your work and uh, follow the career path? Sure. Okay. So um, I am learning to be much more intentional about how to, you know, combat burnout and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And there are, like, I think there are different types of artists who need to do different sorts of things. And so our learning processes are different. And so there's not really a one size fits all process for, you know, how to become your best artist. And I've learned that for me in particular, I can't be one of those artists who draws every single day. I think, you know, there's this inclination to, you know, uh, drive home a sense of discipline in students who are, you know, burgeoning artists or creatives that you have to practice all of the time. Um, And practice is fantastic. I hope that people do more of it. It's been a wonderful thing for me. But I've also found that, you know, if you're an artist and you love your work, you kind of have to think about it as a relationship where occasionally you need a little bit of space. If you want to keep the relationship healthy and if you want it to be a long-term relationship, you kind of have to find ways to step back occasionally and have time to yourself away from it so that you can always feel that spark of excitement that you can, you know, get back into it and relearn the ways in which you love this thing that you do. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if I'm trying to keep a healthy relationship with my art, I need to step back every once in a while and take breaks. And so usually if I start to feel a little burned out, that's when I know that I need to look for inspiration. I need to go and, you know, watch movies and play video games and, uh, you know, read other comics and read other books and strike up a new podcast or something Mm -hmm. like that. Like, I I think we sort of underestimate the degree to which 
other work can really nourish our own creativity. And that's such an important thing to do. Um, not only do you, you know, risk injuring yourself fewer times <laughs> if you, you know, take a step and move away from your drawing desk, but you have more stories to tell at the end of the day. If you listen to other people, you can't just be output all of the time. Mm -hmm. You have to be in the world so that you have something to say. So, yeah. so my, my, my kind of, you know, broad creative advice and what I do for inspiration is I, I admire other people's work. I admire other artists. I go and find things that excite me that are so different from the work that I would do and kind of, you know, push the ways in which I think about creativity. I mean, I, I think I'm also one of those artists who doesn't tend to consume the same kind of work that I make all the time. I love the work that I make and I'm I'm pretty proud of it. I don't have that like secondhand artist embarrassment of looking back on old work and and mm -hmm. thinking, oh, like this could be so much better because I, I've developed the sense that like, you know, every step is really important and I'm proud of where I was and where I am. So I don't have like that kind of brought relationship with my own art, but I, I need to um, figure out ways to appreciate the ways that other people think about their work because it can be instructive or it can just be amusing. And both of those things are incredibly valuable for an artist to take in or just like as a human person, appreciating the ways in which people are expressing themselves. So, so my thing is just, you know, get out and have fun and enjoy other people's work and not worry about whether it's, you know, important, capital I, you know, highbrow or <laughs> Or low brow, like you just play an old video game, listen to music, do whatever it is that you enjoy, because all of those things are art that will inform the way that you work and the way that you navigate the world. It's all important. Love that. Yeah. And I love that human centered aspect of storytelling. It's part of what I love as a reader, as a creator, as an educator. Uh, it's, it's just this way of sharing stories and inspiration. So I, I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. Um, so the the part B to that was oh where yes can, where can we go to find out more? <laughs> I'm so bad at promoting myself everywhere except for you know online, um, which is where most people can find me. I'm pretty easy to find on social media. I'm just at Trungles everywhere. Um, S T R U N G L E S. Um, I'm pretty active on. I'm regularly active on Instagram. Um, I post occasionally on Tumblr. I use Blue Sky now, um, whatever Twitter was. I don't use that quite so much anymore, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I'm around. I'm pretty easy to find. Yeah, yeah, cool. I, I have one more question that comes to mind if we have time and then we can, yeah. of course, touch anything that we've missed. Um, what is it that you hope if there's uh, one thing or one particular set of ideas, um, what do you hope readers sort of think about and explore for themselves once they've encountered your work? Um, well, you know what? I don't think that I have any, I don't have any notions about, you know, what readers should get out of my work. No. Um, I think I've developed a pretty healthy sense of, you know, like a reader's relationship with a, with a work is personal to them and it has nothing to do with me even though I'm the author like it's none of my business actually whether they enjoy my work or not and it's lovely when people tell me that they enjoyed my work I think that's always fantastic but, you know I don't read the reviews and I don't explore that and so I I have no agenda you know when someone reads my work I don't want a reader to think that I have a particular lesson to impart they can take away whatever it is that they want to take away or not um I think one of the things that I want people to kind of latch on to and internalize when it comes to their relationship to books and reading in general, not just with comics, um, is that, and I wonder if this is not even something that, you know, young readers need to keep in mind all the time, because this is something that they already kind of do. I think older people, like older readers, um, and people who interact with literature around young people who are adults, um, I need to have more trust in in what kids can handle because sure. one of the things about books that I think is really wonderful is that they're radically dependent on your sense of consent over the material that you you know take in and it can be like if you have to read a thing for you know class it can feel a little bit different and I think that's most people's relationship with fraught literature for them is that you know you know, they have to read a thing but for the most part you know when you're an adult and you're navigating the world reading is largely optional mm -hmm. and you control what it is that you read or you don't and younger readers have a really fantastic sense of like oh this isn't for me something else can be for me and that's 
that's really wonderful. I want people to, you know, especially younger readers to develop that sense of trust in their own tastes and, yeah. you know, their own boundaries. And, and books are, are so wonderful in that they, they facilitate that relationship really well, where they're so personal and they require constant permission and you can pick them up and put them down whenever you're feeling ready or not ready for them. You can put them away. You can control the sense of timing. You can read over a long stretch of time if you know, you're know you not on deadline or if you don't have a homework assignment due or something. Um, and so you know, developing that sense of freedom with books where you don't have to feel like you need to finish a book at a pace that's not your own or you don't need to consume material that you're not, you know, super ready for. I think all of those things are, are things that, you know, younger readers learn in a very second nature kind of way. But I think we forget as adults that they can do that for themselves. So I, I want everyone to trust younger readers more <laughs> it, yes. um, to understand themselves. Love it. Absolutely. I, I appreciate so much of what you've said there. And I find myself in that conflict sometimes as an English teacher, because I'm supposed to teach the theme. And, right. and of course, I have a, a good time subverting that and saying there is no the theme. There's mm -hmm. you and and the author and what you take away from that unique experience. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, That's such a wonderful thing when, you know, you, you when you talk to a, a younger reader about the book that they're consuming and they have all of these experiences and these emotional reactions and you're like, listen, you think that the author is brilliant, but most of that is you actually. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, ha have we missed anything in the talk through that you want to make sure to share? Um, you know what? I don't know. I feel like we've strayed from comics quite a bit. Like I am a big comics person, but we wound up just talking about literature a lot. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have done a lot of kind of exploring in different kind of comics media i i don't i'm not really the sort of person with the mileage to you know like a monthly comics mm -hmm. um kind of schedule <laughs> like i can't do a regular superhero series but i've been able to get my hands on some superhero projects whenever um the very kind editors at dc and marvel think that there's a project that i'm appropriate for um, yeah, I think that's the one other thing that I would kind of want to put out into the world is that you don't have to follow someone else's style guide necessarily. I, I think I developed an understanding that my style being what it is was not appropriate for superheroes and I had no designs on working on any of that sort of stuff, but it wound up happening anyway because, you know, people, um, the editors are, are thoughtful and smart and um, just really kind of passionate about broadening the form in ways that surprise me uh someone who you know has spent a lot of time thinking about ephemera and iconography like it's it's something that uh we all seem to be having an evolving sense of its place in our culture and i think that's that's really fun and exciting so you know just, just you don't have to conform to someone else's aesthetic inclinations you really can just do whatever you want yeah yeah are there particular characters and story worlds that you're drawn to in that way oh gosh yeah i um so I've never been like a huge, you know, comics, uh, like superhero comics person. I don't follow the stories very well. And every time I've worked on a superhero property, I've relied on the editor to, you know, keep me in line and make sure that all of the the details are right. And, you know, I, they'll like, ref they'll refer me to the wiki most of the time anyway. <laughs> right, but, right. Um, but I think, you know, the, the story universes that I tend to love are, you know, for, in DC comics, there's the, the narrative of the... Um, of the immigrants so frequently. Like I love Starfire um, because her journey kind of parallels mine quite a bit where, you know, you land a new, in a new place and you have to learn a new culture and a new language. And, you know, you try to kind of be as the best version of yourself that you can be so that you, you know, somehow are a good ambassador. Um, that wow. sense of, you know, being, uh, trying to kind of better the place that you find yourself in is something that I've always felt really drawn to. Superman is like that. Wonder Woman to a certain extent is also kind of like that as well. So those kinds of like the 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 metaphor of like the alien is something that I find to be really fun. Um, and on the Marvel end of things, um, I'm kind of learning to explore the, t the sliding time scale. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. And so, you know, because I, I occasionally will pop onto podcasts to talk about certain characters, um, I'm learning a lot about their histories and kind of learning to appreciate the ways in which authors have been really intentional and also the ways in which there are limitations to access to, you know, information about culture over certain points in time. And so um, I had an opportunity to sort of, you know, course correct uh, the character Karma for Marvel. And she's 
uh, Marvel's first kind of out lesbian character and one of the only Vietnamese characters mm -hmm. in the Marvel universe. So I felt like it was important to kind of get it right. And so I had an opportunity to kind of correct that um, that record in terms of renaming her a little bit. Um, but in doing that, I went back and read, you know, some of the old Claremont issues where it dealt with her and her family ties and, you know, and it was actually quite a bit more sensitively written than I would have assumed that it was like it really yeah. like Chris Claremont did a really lovely job. And so it's one of those things where, you know, I feel like I have all these notions about you know, things being a product of their time and then coming out of it, understanding that a lot of the times, you know, people were doing their best with the structures that were available to them. And that's yeah. a really beautiful thing to be able to understand. And so you find that literature from the past becomes less daunting or less fraught to you in, in certain ways. And it feels a little bit more, um, it feels lighter. It feels like you can explore a little more. So, so superheroes have been, have been fun to explore recently. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I've heard some interviews with Chris Claremont and gotten to hear some of the insights that he had about creating characters and the way that he, uh, he, he did attempt um, to create some some stories that went to interesting places. But I also love sort of the, the chain of creativity, and how hopefully there's there's much more of that happening now. And hopefully it continues to happen in authentic ways as well. I think it's a great uh, conversation across comics and here we are back to literature again right. but, uh... <laughs> <laughs> because comics are literature they're books yeah. like we can't we can't really get away from that yeah exactly exactly um but but i greatly appreciate your time and appreciate the work that you're doing and always excited to to hear more and always glad to speak with you in in the space of the podcast or uh maybe even in person at a conference at some <laughs> point or something like that <laughs> i'm um, sure we'll run into each other at some point I am sure. I'm sure. Uh, but great to meet you. And, and thanks again so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was a delightful conversation. <laughs>